I will kneel in the dust at the foot of the cross where mercy paid for me. Where the wrath I deserve, it is gone, it has passed, your blood has hidden me. Mercy, mercy, as endless as the sea. I'll sing your hallelujah for all eternity. We will lift up the cup and the bread we will break remembering your love we were fallen from grace but you took all our shame and nailed it to a cross mercy mercy as endless as the sea I'll sing your hallelujah for all eternity mercy mercy as endless as the sea I'll sing your hallelujah for all eternity sing your hallelujah hallelujah amen may i never lose the wonder or the wonder of your mercy may i sing your hallelujah hallelujah amen may i never Lose the wonder, oh, the wonder of your mercy. May I sing your hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. May I never lose the wonder, oh, the wonder of your mercy. May I sing your the wonder, oh the wonder of your mercy, may I sing your hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, may I never lose the wonder, oh the wonder of your mercy, may I sing your hallelujah, Hallelujah, amen. I will kneel in the dust at the foot of the cross where mercy paid for me. Amen.
David, thank you. That was awesome. That was a, a song I asked uh, David to sing. I especially like the last part of it where it talks about, may I never lose the wonder of your mercy. You know, part of the thing that is wrong with uh, the church today is we've forgotten what it was like when we were lost. And, and we don't concentrate on the wonder of our salvation. It's good to think back. Think back when, when you were lost and how you dealt with things, how, how uh, hard life was. And you know, the, the, the pressures and, and how hard life is doesn't change when you get saved. You know, the, the guy that uh, led me to Christ acted like, uh, you know, once I came to Christ, all my troubles were going to end. So I might punch him when I get to heaven. But, uh, but the point is, there's no problem that God can't handle through you. That's the wonder of his mercy. No matter what happens to us, we have the love of God, the love of Christ, through, you know, just shines light through our heart. And, and we're different. But you know what? Um, I'm going to talk about, Peter's going to talk about, and I'm just going to explain to you what Peter is saying. He's going to talk about being victimized. You ever been victimized? Taken advantage of? Ripped off? <laughs> and that's just a church. Uh, <laughs> But you get, you get out there and it can all go bad on you. And I was thinking about this before I get to Peter, and I, I turned over to John 1, because we had studied about John the Baptist, and Jesus came, and he was baptized, and, and as he was walking away, uh, John said, Behold the Lamb of God, and there were two of his disciples that heard it. And those disciples made the decision that they were going to leave John the Baptist, and they were going to follow Jesus. They had no idea what that would mean. And so they, they began to run after Jesus. And, and they said, Rabbi, Rabbi, you know, where are you staying? Because that was the tradition. If a rabbi came and you kind of liked what he said and how he, how he was teaching, you would follow him for a period of time. And so they wanted to know where Jesus was headed. They had no idea that he had nowhere to lay his head. And, and they asked him the question, you know, where, where are you going? Where, where, where can we come follow you? Where where can we be? And so he, he turned and he looked at them. And great leaders do this. They ask questions instead of give answers. And he said, what do you want? What do you seek? What are you looking for? And then he said, follow me. Do you know who, two, who those two guys were? Andrew and John. The first two disciples he called. They were disciples of John the Baptist. They, they were running to see what John the Baptist was doing. So where Jesus was headed, he was headed, he was headed to Peter's house is where he was headed. And that's why then when you hear the story about how Peter is called, how Jesus takes him out and tells him to fish again, and, and the boats are overloaded, and Peter begins to get the idea, this is Messiah, because Andrew had come to him and said, we have found Messiah. Jesus proved himself to be that, and they followed him, never knowing what this would lead to. They followed him without any idea of what they were going to have to go through in life, and it was going to be tough. <laughs> I think Jesus must have smiled and think, well, you want to follow me now, but hang on, because this, this is a double E ride at, at Disney World. This is, I mean, it's going to have a lot of twists and turns to it, right? And so... Uh, I thought about that, and I, I pulled over to Psalms, because I love it that the Bible doesn't avoid heartaches and, and victimization and all that. And I, I love Psalm 131. One of the reasons I like it, and certainly is because of what it says, but it says it quickly. It's a smaller psalm. This is the whole psalm. It said, Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I, I do not concern myself with matters too great or too awesome for me to grasp. Instead, I have I have calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a, like a weaned child, it is my soul within me. Israel, put your hope in the Lord now and always. That is, that is some great advice when you find yourself being, being victimized. You begin to think about it and you're, you begin to churn and you begin to come angry and then all of a sudden you realize God has a better way for you than that. And the psalmist knew that. 
And this is David, of course, who had to run for doing a good thing. All he did was kill a giant that Saul was unwilling to even try to kill. And, and for 10 to 14 years, Saul will come after him because Saul is prideful. And Saul wants to be the head guy. And he realized the people love David. And so he wants to do away with David. And David says, you know, I'm, I'm like a child laying on its mother's breast, satisfied. Satisfied with, with what I have and where I am. There's a sense of, I know I'm, I'm helpless without you. And I, I've learned to just lean on you. Uh, then I like Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. It says, But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who, who created you, Israel. The one uh, who, who formed you says... Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by your name, and you are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, I will not let you drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel your Savior. I love the practicality of that. He doesn't say you're not going to have trouble. What he says is when you have trouble, when you find yourself in deep waters. Have you ever found yourself in deep water? I love that analogy because uh, I've been in deep water. I know what that feels like. Um, you know, we, we would go to Huntington Beach and they have a pier out there and to impress the girls, we would decided we would swim out beyond the pier because we saw the, the lifeguards do that. So me and a couple dumb dummies, you know, we jump in the water and we swim out. And I'm thinking as I'm swimming, man, this is easy. You know, I'm, I thought it would be hard going out because of the undertow, okay? I hadn't taken oceanography yet to learn that the, the undertow close to shore is the force that makes you fall out to sea. When you get past the breakers, what happens is there's this pull and it's several miles an hour. And so uh, swimming in that is great. But then you turn around, you're in trouble. You're in deep water. And, and you learn that you have to swim this way a little ways, and then you have to swim that way a little ways, and this way. And by the time I got to shore, I was not impressing anybody. All I could do was lay there. But when you're in deep waters, God knows. And God is there. When the rivers are overflowing and, and, and they're taking you over, God is there. He says, you, and when you go through the fire, he says you won't be burned up. He doesn't say you won't get singed. Things happen. Hard things happen to us. And we've been ripped off. I think about David having to run and then Joseph being sold by his brothers. And all that he had to go through. And yet God comes around and takes care of him. There were probably no deeper waters anybody could go through than what he went through. And, uh, and, and then Jacob, of course, you know, talked, uh, talked to Esau into selling him his, uh, you know, his birthright. And, and they had family conflict forever after that. Have you ever had family conflict? Some of you got family who haven't speak, spoken to you in years. And you haven't spoken to them. You have favorite people. I had a favorite uncle. Uncle and aunt, they just, they disappeared. They didn't talk to us for like a decade. And it, you, you wonder what happens. And then time goes by and people don't even know, don't even know why they're aggravated at each other. I sat with a family the other day, listened to them, and they, they can't hear each other. I mean, they're in so much turmoil, they don't realize that both of them are desperately in love with the others. The, the parents certainly are in love with their children, and the children are in love with their parents, but they're so angry at each other because they both feel victimized. Does this sound familiar? Yeah. Real familiar to the churches who are in the area. Remember they, in, in the area of Pontus, Galatia, Capper, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are the churches that he's writing to, and he knows they're under great and massive persecution. He knows that it's coming hard, and it's coming often, 
and it's consistent. And, and, uh, and now Paul has been beheaded, and probably by the time they're reading this letter, uh, Peter's been crucified upside down. And, and he knows this ch these churches are going to fall apart unless they trust the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and strength. And much of what he says is echoed in Paul's writings. And I think it's interesting, these are all churches that Paul had started, and Peter recognized they're going to need the help. And so he, from his own uh, time with walking with Jesus and understanding things, he begins to feed into them. Now, when we get wronged, we have three natural reactions when, when we have unfair treatment, right? Think of our reaction. The first reaction is revenge. It's an aggressive action. We get bitter quickly, and we begin to think, how can we get back? And we begin to make elaborate plans about, about vengeance and about revenge and, ha and how we're going to end up on top. Uh, it reminds me of the guy who was at the doctor's office, and he said, you're testing positive for rabies. And the man grabbed a piece of paper, and he started to write, and the doctor thought, well, man, he thinks he's going to die. He's writing out his last will and testament. And he says, you're going to be okay. He says, you're not going to die. And he said, no, I'm not writing a will. I'm writing the names of the people that I'm going to bite. <laughs> right? That's aggressive. That's what happens to us. The worst part of who we are shows up. And it shows up, and, and it, it, it seemingly won't go away. I mean, we're, we're enraged about things, and we play it over and over and over in our minds. A lot of things that happen to us aren't really that big a deal, but, boy, we just we work them over, and we perseverate. I love that word. It's a big word. I know you now think I'm erudite. Don't ask me to spell either one of those words. But, but we just concentrate on it over and over and over again. And this rage comes up. And that's the most natural thing to do. Second thing that happens to us is sometimes we get passive aggressive. Ugh. That's really tough. Have you ever had anybody smile at you and you know they don't like you? They think you did them wrong and yet they're still grinning at you. They're still saying nice things. You know they don't mean it. And then they start saying other things that, you know, that are kind of jabby. And you realize there's a problem, but they won't engage. It's passive aggressive. And a lot of us are like that. Uh, I heard about a, a, a guy that was, you know, he was pledging to be in this fraternity. And, of course, when you pledge to be in a fraternity, they, they really get hard on you. But this guy, they got extra hard on. I mean, they would put a bucket on top of a door, so when we walked through, he'd get drenched. You know, they put Vaseline on his, on his toothbrush and, you know, just a lot of nasty things they did. They nailed his tennis shoes to the floor, you know. I mean, just, they just kept tormenting him, tormenting him. They realized they'd gone too far. And they were making him do all the cooking. And so at Christmas time, they got together and they said, yeah, we've bullied this guy long enough. We're going to let him off the hook. And so they go and they tell him, listen, you know, everything we've been doing to you, we're going to stop that's just wrong. But, but we're, we're hoping you continue to, to be with us and, and, and do our cooking because your cooking is great. So the young man said, okay. All right, so no more buckets on the... No. You're not going to nail my shoes? To, no. No more Vaseline on, in, on my tooth? No. He said, okay, deal. No more spitting in the soup. <laughs> Passive-aggressive. You do something to me, you end of the soup. Have you ever worked at a drive-thru? Huh? Yeah. Don't ever give them a hard time when they're ordering that hamburger, I'm just telling you. <laughs> That'll ruin it forever, won't it? I know for sure Jack in the Box, because I work there. Uh, so that the, third, the third reaction is just denial. And, and we, just, we just doubt everything and we, and we become disillusioned about life and we don't want to engage anymore because we've been wronged and, and we just sort of, sort of check out, check out of life and, and, and nobody, can, nobody can talk to us, nobody can encourage us. We're just kind of living, just kind of going through life because we got victimized. And, and you sit around and you say, why did God do this to me? 
You know, where's God in all this? It says if I pray, he'll do this and that. And no, no. God never promised you a rose garden. So the idea that God has somehow abandoned you because you've been victimized is actually the opposite of probably what's going to happen. If you're a Christian, I guarantee you, and you do it right, you're going to get victimized because of the culture you're in. Which is why most of us back away from our Christianity and begin to feed into the culture. That's what Peter was telling us last time when he talked about don't fall back into your old ways. Don't drift back into the culture because you know you can get along. Don't do it the way they do it. I mean, if, if, you, had to, if you had to test everybody that knows you and is around you, would they say you're living out your Christianity or would they say you're just blending in? That's, that's where we are. So that takes me to Peter, and we're in Peter's second chapter, verses 13 through 17. And Peter is going to begin to talk to them as, they, as he knows they're going to suffer. And he says, for the Lord's sake, sue everybody into place. For the Lord's sake, call all the officials and tell them what these people have done wrong. Report them. For the Lord's sake, show revenge. Get passive-aggressive. Don't do their stuff. For the Lord's sake, just deny what's going on. No. For the Lord's sake, submit. The most hated word in Scripture. For the human mind. I mean, what odd counsel. You're being unfairly treated, persecuted. I guarantee you go to a counselor, you go to a pastor, you go to a friend. They're going to say, man, they're ripping you off. Here's what you need to do. Get it together. Call a lawyer. Do this, do that. And it, it starts coming out of our mouth, and we become Job's friend. We're not helping. I had a young man call me. He's in a church. He's on a staff. And, uh, and, and they, they're going to let him go. And so he called, and we're talking that through, and, and I realized that they're just handling this so poorly. They're mistreating him. They're just launching him. And, and so, you know, he's called me for wisdom, and so I start giving it to him. Okay, I got this lawyer. You need to call him because there are laws on the books that say they can't treat you like that. Now, you're not going to sue him, but we're going to scare the pee waddly out of him. I'm going to get you with this guy, and here's what you say. When they meet with you, and you do your exit interview, and demand you get an exit interview, and you sit there, and you tell them this, this, and that, and, and at, at the least, you're going to get six months' worth of severance if you'll do exactly what I'm telling you to do. Great advice. Right? Super advice. Advice that if he took would work. And so this young man says to me, he said, you know, thanks, but he said, I just, I feel like uh, I'm hurt. I'm frustrated. I'm angry, but I just sense that God's moving me, and I didn't know it. God's moving me, and it doesn't feel like the right time to me, but it doesn't have to, because God is God. And I said, well, you're right. Don't listen to me. You know what happened to that young man? I mean, within... Two weeks? This morning he's, he's in a church in view of a call that is desiring to bring him in. And as he's gone through the interview, he's realized how God has moved him and how he wouldn't have moved himself. And they're going to pay him more money. And I said, man, I'm glad you did not listen to me. When you're the target of mistreatment, you know, the people around you you know, they, they want to fight for you. They want to take up your offense. And a lot of times when, when you've been offended, you can't listen to them. Right? And it might be the ones closest to you. You know, hey, baby, you know what happened to me at work today? You need to go back, and, you know, and you get all this advice. But Scripture says, for the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority. Whether the king is the head of the state or, uh, or the officials he has appointed, for the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. So he, he begins by saying, it doesn't matter. Nero, who hates you, Nero, who, who recognizes that, that 
you're responsible for the Christianity, and he hates Christianity. And whoever he assigns over you, they're in authority over you. And you must listen to them. You must do what they say. I'm not so sure you can fully understand that unless you're a Democrat right now. That's funny, you'll get it later. Because you've got to listen. You have to listen to the authorities. They, they're, they're not gonna, they're gonna not going to be right all the time. But they are the authorities. And then in verse 15, he tells us why. He says, it is God's will that, that your honorable lives should be silent. So those ignorant people who, who make foolish accusations against you, for you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse for evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers and fear God and respect the king. So in verse 15, he tells us why. Because there are rumors soaring about who Christianity is at this time. It's kind of hard for us to, to really grasp hold of that. And, and he's, he's saying there, there are those out there that are coming to get you. There is Nero. Nero wants to get rid of all of the Christians. And these people know that their Christian friends in Rome are using to light up the streets of Rome. They're being killed in the Colosseums. And he realizes these people he's assigning over them hate Christianity. And they're going to be persecuted. And, and Peter says it's God's will that you remain honorable. Honorable, upright. That you don't traffic in the same things they traffic in. Even though they're fools. You stay silence, uh, silent and be honorable and your silence will be a testimony of your faith. And your faith can grow more real. And then he gives them that command. And the command, is, there, there are several things. Uh, but at the same time, I want you to hear that God never tells the Christian community to do anarchy. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says that we're supposed to revolt. That we're supposed to get together as a group and chase down the government and get rid of the bad government. I think it's so interesting that the Pharisees thought that's what Messiah was going to do. That Messiah was going to get here and then he was going to take care of the Romans. And nowhere in Scripture, I dare you, you can't find it anywhere, where we are supposed to do anarchy. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't stand up for ourselves. It doesn't mean when we see the government do something that's not biblical that we don't participate and speak against. We should do that with, with great fervor, but we never advocate violence against the government or anarchy of any kind. If anything, we're to be praying for those who are in authority over us. Praying. It's, it's President's Day next Monday. And what you ought to do on President's Day is pray for the president. What a concept. He may not be your favorite guy. I don't think he's anybody's favorite guy. But God doesn't say, pray for him if he's cool. God doesn't say, pray for him if, he, if you like him or you like his politics. doesn't say that. It just says, pray for those who are in authority. You have no idea what it means to be in authority unless you've been there. And the load and the victimization you feel while in that authority. So Peter is saying, listen, get to it understand it and at the same time we render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's so it's appropriate sometime to stand up it's appropriate sometime when you're being wrong there are there are things within the government to protect you if if something happened at work uh, HR is now a major science if, if you're at work and, and you have to take a leave of absence because of an injury or because, because of uh, abuse in your own life, because you're abusing alcohol or whatever, and you take the time off, that business, by law, has to keep your job open or one at the same level for when you come back. That's the law. And you've got people like the Texas Commission and other people that if they don't obey that law, they'll step in. It's okay to use what Caesar has given us. 
What's not okay is for us to just go off the rails and scream and, and, and try for revenge or, or passive aggressively go in and spit in the soup or deny that it's happening to you. And so Peter is trying to tell them, but he also knows nobody wants to submit. You know, the problem isn't that we don't understand this. <laughs> the problem is we don't want to do it. When was the last time you jumped up in the morning and thought, man, this would be a good day to submit <laughs> to whatever anybody tells me. No matter how foolish or how ignorant they are, I can't wait for the day to start. I get to submit all over the place. Woo! You've never done that, have you? I don't think you ever will. And yet God says that we are to submit. Then he gives where he says, slaves, so. And he gives gives five commands. And I want us to look at those commands. Uh, these are principles for, for the struggle. And, and these are the things that he says. The first thing he says, act like a free man. That's the first thing. When, when you begin to get victimized by authorities, act like a free man. You have been set free. No matter what they do to you, even if they imprison you, you are still set free. If they tie you up, you are still free. Because God has freed you. Just like Isaiah said, you are mine. You've been freed. You've been bought with a price. Have mercy for the wonders of your love. Have mercy. Understand that I am there with you in the midst of that. So the, the first thing we're to do is act like a free man. You could, you could even say act like you know Christ. You know, act, act like you know what you're doing. Second thing, respect everyone. Respect everyone, whether they respect you or not. You know, respect has sort of found its way off the map, hasn't it? It's just not there. And, and when, when, when that goes away, there's nothing but anarchy in the society. And you have to think about who do you respect? I mean, there's no respect for police, for the police force. I was, I was thrilled. We, uh, at the end of the year, we had some extra money, and so we gave a little bit to the Carrollton Police Department so they could have their banquet and honor, eat, honor you know, who's the, the, the number one detective and, and who was the number one officer. And, and the Dorns and us got to go to that. We spent your money, but we got to go. And, uh, and, and so it was, it, there they were, all those police officers. And, but they're not dressed like police officers, they're dressed like people. Because they are people. They have feelings. And you'd hear about the kind and gentle ways that many of them are. And you think about it, they see people at their absolute worst time in their life. Under the greatest pressure they'll ever be under. And, and they've got to set a tone and they've got to do all that. And so, so the Bible says respect everyone. Everyone. Respect them. You, you owe people your respect. If you know Christ as your personal Savior, you owe every human being your respect because you know. You know that they can, they can possibly come to know Christ and there could be a change in their lives. And then he says something that seems odd in the list. Love believers. Why is that in there? Because we have such a difficult time loving each other. That's why it's there. You know, you, 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 you hurt each other. You know, we're supposed to huddle up, but when, you know, sometimes you feel like you're huddling up with a porcupine. You know, you, there's, there's the idea that we've got to love each other through it. We've got to be there for each other. There's a sense of fellowship and brotherhood within the body of Christ that needs to be there because we're all hurting in some area or another. And it's not, it may not be in the same area for any of us, and yet all of us go through life, and life is a struggle. We do prison ministry. What a wonderful thing. Because there are believers in prison. There are people that are incarcerated today, and we can love on them. We can respect everyone, love the brethren. And then he says, fear God. 
Fear means to know God, to know he's there. To not have that constant doubt that even though you're going through something horrible, you know that God is with you, that you are his own, that your salvation is solid. So you think about the wonder, oh, the wonder of the glories of his mercy. It comes to your heart again, over and over again. Oh, the wonders of his mercy. I will sing hallelujah because of the wonders of his mercy. I'm not going to do that when things are going great because I'm not going to pay attention to that. It's when stress and, and violence and, and vindictiveness and wrong things and unfair treatment come to me. That's when I'm going to remember the mercy. That's when I need to sing hallelujah. That's when I need that song in my heart. And I, I had a coach, and if we won the game, he was not happy. And we'd always ask him, why aren't you happy? So you didn't learn anything. You, when you lose, you learn. When something gets taken from you, 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 you don't, it, that doesn't feel right, and so you begin to push so you can become better. He really liked it when we win, but he never said he did. Then, respect authority. This is not an easy list. Act like your faith is real. Respect everyone. Love believers. Some of you aren't very lovable. Did you know that? You ever met an un unlovable brother? You haven't? Okay, all right, good for you. We're all wonderful. We can go home. <laughs> Fear God. Know he's there. And then respect authority. Not always easy. So then Peter goes on and he decides, I better give him a good example. That's tough counsel. Very difficult. So I'm going to give him a good example. And so he gives the good example in verse 18. He says, you are slaves. You who are slaves must submit. Ah, man, there it is again. And, you know, uh, it's hard to get around this mentally because you're in a Western civilization, and we understand things differently. We're not slaves. Uh, we've never really been slaves, but maybe this, is a, uh, maybe this will help you to think in terms of your slavery is your employment. Because we are a slave to employment. All of us have to have employment to eat. Well, not exactly. I mean, there's other ways around that. But, but scripturally, we, we should work for what we earn so that we can sustain life. And so in a sense, we are a slave to having a job different from the slavery in the first century. By the time Peter is writing this, there are 60 million slaves in Rome. 60 million over the Roman Empire. And, and the way that came about is the Roman Empire decided since we're in charge and we're masters of the world, we should be pampered. I like that. Yeah, that feels good. You know, if I'm in charge, I should be pampered. If I'm the boss, you should do what I want when I want it done the way I want it done. You ever know anybody like that? Nobody point. <laughs> but pulpits are filled with guys like that. Businesses are filled with guys like that. Nonprofits that do godly work are filled with people like that. The idea that I'm in charge, I invented this thing, this is mine, and the rest of you will do what I want to do, the way I want to do it, when I want it done. And Peter knows that. And he says, submit. Oh, man, are you kidding me? Submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. Ah, man. Slaves in the first century, they weren't just workers that you see out doing hard labor. Slaves were doctors and teachers and entertainers, skilled laborers. Slaves were, were treated legally as though they were an animal. So they couldn't marry, but they would cohabitate, and their children would belong to whoever owned that particular slave. If two slaves got together from two different owners and they, they only had one child, then they had to make out some arrangement. They bought, a lot, bought it like an animal. 
They were, they were no more than trading commodities. But it doesn't mean they all lived miserable lives. Matter of fact, some of them lived pampered lives. They were educated. And they did jobs that were, that were incredible kind of jobs. And it was because Rome laid down. And Rome didn't do anything. They didn't lift a finger. Hand me a grape, you know. That was some guy's job. Boom. Throw it in the guy's mouth. That's what led to the demise of Rome. They were poor masters for their slaves. That's what happens to corporations. They become bad CEOs and they go away. Because uh, they're, not, they're not doing the right thing the right way. Um, so, he is saying that, that we, we got to obey. And then he goes on, he says, For God is pleased... When, uh, uh, when, conscious, when you're conscious of his will and you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and, and, you, are, and, and you endure it with patience, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good deeds, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his footsteps. That's our purpose. And I love what Peter says, you know, if you get punished for doing something that's wrong, that's okay. That's, that's normal. I mean, if... if if you commit a crime and you have to do prison time because of the crime, that's just the way the civilization is made up. That's why we obey the authorities. That's why even, even civil authorities with, with, uh, with the, the city of Carrollton, I mean, we can't disobey it because we don't want to do it. I mean, they, they tell you how many seats you can have, how many parking spots you have to have for how many seats you have in a place. And then they tell you how many people can be in here, and if you have more people than that, you broke the law. And we need to follow that. That's what he's saying. He's saying you, you, you follow what your master wants. And if you get beaten for it, and you patiently endure it, that pleases God. Patiently endure the beating. Patiently endure the suffering. And... It's not a pleasant thing, but it's our purpose. So he gives them that as an example. God is with you. If you've done the right thing and you still get treated unfairly, God is with you. If you do the wrong thing, you take the pain. Now, he goes from a good example to a great example. He goes from from the example that he's just given, and then in perfect truth and candor, without any deceit, he talks about the Savior. He says he never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when, when he was insulted, nor th threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his cause in the hands of God. Now, you ought to just underline that in your Bible. That, that's a big tip. If you're looking for a big tip on how to get through suffering and pain and, and how to walk through injustice, there's a tip right there. He said that Jesus left his case in the hands of God. When you find yourself being treated unfairly, if you would just say to yourself, I'm going to leave my case in the hands of God. I'm not going not to plead it out myself. I'm not going to be my own lawyer. I'm not going to get a lawyer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow God to... to to plead my case for me. And he says, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body to the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. See, there's the, the great example. The perfect example. Jesus taking the cross with, with no deceit. You know, you, you, can, you can take submission to some unhealthy place and just submit to everything. 
But, you know, I don't think too many of us are in danger of that. I mean, when was the, when was the last time you shut your mouth and you let God be glorified? That happens less than the other. And so we, we've got to understand what, what Peter is saying is that God took all of our sins that he suffered. This is the greatest example. That he was beaten. He was treated unfairly. He was spit upon. His beard was pulled out. As a matter of fact, the word when he says, by his wounds, if you read that in the Greek, it, it, uh, Peter is saying, by his welt. And what Peter is trying to express is that by the time Jesus is on the, the Via Della Rosa with the cross on his back, he no longer looks like a human being. He looks like a beaten welt. That's the word he uses. One massive, large, hemorrhaging bruise. Unrecognizable. Now, Jesus can do that for you. What are you willing to suffer for him? That's the message. As hard as it is, as difficult as it's going to be the next time you face unjust treatment, you have to consider what the Bible says we are to do. And do it. In 2.25, he says this. Once you were sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your soul. The guardian of your soul. There wasn't a martyr in Christianity from the very beginning, from the, from the 11 that were, that were martyred. They, they, they died honorably. They died on their feet they died with the guardian of their soul, ready to, ready to welcome them into heaven. God wants us to be an honorable people. Submission is what causes us to return to our shepherd for his protection. Our arrogance to do it on our own is simply pride. And real humility is submission to God. And when you submit to God, you are, you are reminded of the wonder of his mercy. And you begin to sing hallelujah instead of woe is me. And you begin to wander back into the fold of the shepherd. shepherd and, and scripture comes alive again for you. You begin to understand some things. And so you begin to think about what is your life known for? Is it known for Christ or is it known for, for coming out like a... Banny rooster when things don't go your way. In the place that you're a slave. You know, I look back at, at my work life and I feel so fortunate. Uh, you know, I've never been out of work unless I wanted to be. My whole life, I've had the privilege to work. And be in good places and, and, and be treated well and be treated real and fair. And so have you. And really how, how, fa how unfair it is to, to, to have to spend a long time in unemployment and how that hurts your heart and your soul and your pocketbook. We live in a cruel place in terms of employment, but what are we known for? What is going to be on your tombstone? Stephen Covey has a great illustration in the front of his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, I was going to write a, another book, Seven Habits of Ineffective People, but uh, nobody would buy it. Uh, and and they, they got more than seven habits. But, um, but he starts the book with this illustration. It's a great word picture. He was, he's walking into a church, and the church is filled. And down front is a casket. It's obviously a funeral. There are people up on the stage that are singing beautiful music. And, and there, there are, there's a, a pastor up there who's saying incredible words of eulogy. And he said, but he, he, in his mind, he walks up and he walks over to the casket and he peeks over and he realizes it's him. And he said, that's where you start. That's where you start. You start at the end. You start where we're all going. All of us will die. 
one day you will lie upon a bed on which you too will die. And at that time, when, when life meets death, you'll, you'll be determined your, inter- your eternity. If you know Christ, it's eternity with him and it's glory. If you do not, you will live forever in hell. But you will live forever somewhere, but one day you will die. And you'll be at the front right here and we'll have you in a box. What do you want said? What do you want people thinking? You ever been to a funeral and the pastor says something nice? And you're thinking, did he know this guy? (laughs) Maybe no. What do you want said? What do you want sung? What do you want that time to look like? What do you want to leave behind? Whatever it is, do it now. And do it by submission. Submission to Christ. Submission to his word. Submission of your life, your, your prideful way, your, your arrogance and, and your pridefulness. And, you know, I'm just speaking here. Give that up for submission. The greatest power in the Christian's life is submission. The wonder of God's mercy. That he was submissive to death because of my sin. You want a two word purpose statement? I'm into like one word, two word. Let me give you a two word purpose statement for your life. Die empty. Die empty. Leave it all on the field. Don't go to eternity with a bunch of your Christianity work left undone. Don't enter into eternity with a life that could have served Christ in a much better way, a different way. Don't do that to yourself. It won't matter. You'll still end up in eternity. But the joy, the wonder of the mercy, the wonder of the mercy of God, the hallelujah that you want to sing to him is the work that we get to do right here. You know, I've said before, what I want on my tombstone is, I told him I was sick. (laughs) What I really want is died empty. Left his love for Christ behind to others and headed toward eternity with Christ forever. Let's pray. Father, help us in our slavery, wherever it is that that is for us. Help us, O oh God, to, to give out the light and not the dark. Help us not to get caught up in a culture of death, in a culture that, that is clamoring for its own way. But Father, help us to recognize that all that we do The way that we do all that we do is honorable before God and that you have called us to be honorable people and to be silent when we're treated poorly so that so that you're allowed to speak to those people who are fools and they see Christ in us. Father, help us because we are helpless without you. And Father, we are hopeless without you. So I pray, Lord, that you would be with us in a very special way as we head back into the things that we do day by day. And, Father, that we would would know the wonders of your mercies and that we would share those wonderful mercies over and over in the fields where you take us. In Jesus' name, amen.